All right, class, first off, as always, good day. I'm glad you're here. So today's lesson is going to be talking about uh, some corruption, more corruption than what we talked about with the political bosses and political machines uh, from the previous lesson, okay? This is going to be more about what has happened, not just with um, millionaires and billionaires, but also politicians. Specifically, we're going to look at the South, okay? We're going to go visit the South again. Um, it's been a while since we left the, you know, what happened down there and things like that. Um, so that's what today's lesson is going to be about. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> so we're going to analyze the impact of, well, not the political bosses, but we're going to examine the lengths of these Jim Crow laws, how far they went to stop African Americans from voting, but also not just them, but also poor white people in the South. Okay. And uh, we're going to look at the whole separate but equal argument that the Supreme Court said was cool, you know, back in uh, uh, 1896. So we're going to look at that, see, like, what do they mean, separate but equal, things like that. Okay. All right. So here is your warm up picture. Basically, all I'm asking you is this to look at the picture, look at the background, look at the what's there, look what's written down. And use that information to help you answer this question, which is, what do you think, based off the expression of the people, the black guy, the woman, the man, um, what's happening here? Okay. <clears throat> um, so what do you think is happening? Okay. And now some students ask me, what does the black guy have his hand on, uh, his left hand? And that's a bag. It's a bag with uh, probably his possessions, clothes, you know, things like that, you know. So more likely that's just like instead of a suitcase, you know, just a bag. Okay. So again, think about it. Pause the video. Write your response because we're moving on in three, two, one. So the election of 1896 was pretty interesting in the sense that there was a guy named Williams Jennings Bryant. and he was a Democrat who basically was like, you know what? I'm going to go after these millionaire, billionaire people, you know, uh, because he said, like, they could not have a million dollars, honestly. And he realized, you know, that these guys, Rockefeller, Carnegie, uh, J.P. Morgan, Vanderbilt, you know, and others, that they were making their money off the backs of their workers who were working in horrible conditions working long hours and getting paid basically pennies while these guys are making tons of dollars, you know, and living large. Well, the workers just are living in slums, you know, again, we went over this, you know, the housing. So you shouldn't be surprised. You shouldn't, you shouldn't act like, you know, you don't know what's going on. If you don't know what's going on, you need to go back and listen to those uh, lecture videos because it's pretty bad what these guys were living through. So, <clears throat> uh, William Jennings Bryant said, you know what, I'm going after these guys, I'm going to run for president. And the people who wanted, um, you know, J.P. Morgan and, you know, uh, Rockefeller and all those guys who wanted to keep the status quo, you know, keep things the way they, the way they, things are, they wanted a guy like McKinley. McKinley was a pro-business type of person. Um, and so they went against each other. Bryant gave 600 speeches in 14 weeks that's basically six speeches a day this guy was shaking so many hands his his own hands were swollen he could like barely make a fist because his fingers were so swollen um and the thing is uh when it came to mckinley you know you have to remember there's a lot more poor people than there are rich people when it comes to an election it doesn't matter how much money you use, you know, throwing at you, things like that. It matters how many votes you get. And uh, in this case, there's more poor people than there is rich people. Always in the history of the world, it's the way it's always been. So <clears throat> basically, these uh, owners of factories and businesses who wanted McKinley to win basically threatened their workers, telling them, if you vote for Brian, I'm going to fire you. You're going to lose your job. You know, uh, this business is going to fail. Everyone's going to lose their jobs. 
your pay is going to get cut even more. So they use threats. And one uh, person, one in, uh, business in particular, basically told their employees, I don't care if you vote for Brian or not, but if he wins, don't even bother coming to work. Y'all fire every single one of you. So, yeah, it was pretty bad. Now, nowadays, it's illegal for a business, you know, your bosses to tell you, you have to vote for this person, this person. That's illegal. Um, same thing with churches. They can't tell you, oh, you have to vote for this person or this person. You know, they can't do that. Uh, but back then, they could. And because of those threats, McKinley won. Now we're going to go down to the South and see how things were. Uh, if you remember, things were pretty bad for African Americans and uh, poor white people. Uh, basically, they're, it's like how life was before the Civil War. Working in the fields, getting little to no pay, um, treated like crap, kept down. You know, they really couldn't progress, you know, uh, so it was really hard for them. Now, here's the thing. <clears throat> the people in charge, the uh, Southern politicians, the plantation owners and some of that, they wanted to try to stop uh, African-Americans and poor white people from voting. But here's the thing. Under the 15th Amendment, no one can be denied the right to vote based off your race, uh, color, or previous condition of servitude. Okay, so it doesn't matter if you were once a slave or not. As long as you're of age, you've registered to vote, and depending on which state you're in, you know, you're not in jail or on parole, then you can vote. Okay. But the thing is, the law doesn't say that the government, state or federal, can't require that citizen be literate or own property in order to vote. Um, literate means the ability to read and write. Okay. Now, like I said, poor white people were targeted. I want to make that clear because, again, a lot of people had that notion that. Uh, every white person in the South was racist. They weren't. Okay. Now, they were very, very um, optimistic for getting this thing called the populist movement uh, passed. And, you know, the populist movement basically said it was going to increase political power of farmers. Now, just like uh, rich and poor, there are a lot more small farmers than there are big plantation owners. You know, yeah, they may own a lot of land, but there's only like a handful of them as opposed to these people who own small farms. So they were trying to basically give those guys themselves more political power by saying, hey, there's a bunch of us. We should form a political group and get power. But here's a problem. Um, the rich people, you know, the southern politicians, they made sure to squash these guys. So that they couldn't vote, that they couldn't get political power, because again, they wanted to keep the power for themselves. So here's the first thing that they did to try to stop African Americans and poor white people from voting. They had this thing called the poll tax. Now it says they, right there on the very first line, it was a two dollar tax required by all citizens in order to register to vote. Um, a student a couple years ago asked me, well, why did they all citizens that thought they were just attacking black people. See, here's the thing. If they were to sit, do that, a $2 tax on just black people, then they could be sued. Then the federal government would come down on them saying, you can't do that. You're violating these people's rights. But if they did it for everybody, then it's not picking on anybody in particular. The thing is, they know a lot of these guys, you know, the African-Americans, the farmers, they don't got much money. And I know $2 nowadays doesn't sound like much. You're like, I, I can find that on your couch or in your dryer or in the little cup dispenser thing in your family car. You know, eight quarters, no problem. But back then, that was like 40 bucks, 50 bucks. And those guys needed that money because they were living like basically paycheck to paycheck, you know. And so they needed that money to feed their family, you know, um, you know buy equipment, you know, tools, stuff like that for the farm, uh, you know, buy clothing for their, themselves and their kids, stuff like that. They needed that money. They couldn't just go off and just vote, you know. So 
a lot of these uh, people who wanted to stop them from voting, the African Americans and poor white people from voting, they were like, yes, we got them. But here's the problem. Remember, I said all citizens. So, so there were even some rich people who said, I'm not going to pay $2. No, I'm not going to pay $2. So like, come on, it's just $2. No, I'm not paying no $2. So then they did this thing called an exemption. Basically, you don't have to pay. But here's the stipulations. They said, basically, if you were rich, you didn't have to pay. But if you were poor, you had to pay. Now, there were some students in class who realized, like, wait, that have, that makes no sense at all. If you're rich, you don't have to pay. But if you're poor, you have to pay. And it's like, yeah, they did stuff like that. And, of course, that's where the federal government came in and go, no, 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 no. You can't do that. That makes no sense whatsoever. You know, the people who have no money, you're going to make them pay. But the people who have money, that's all right. They don't have to pay. No. Okay. So they're like, ah, dang it. Okay. Poll tax didn't work. What else could you use? Literacy test. How can you vote if you can't read? Ah. So they required voters to be able to read and understand the state's constitution. So, of course, they had the uh, the rich uh, people, the white people, read this easiest part of the constitution, like usually the beginning. We, the people of the state of la, 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 la. They'd be like, okay, yeah, you, you can read. You're good. And then they would have the African-Americans and read the hardest part of the constitution you know whereas of this uh esteemed state the citizens of such stuff will therefore oh, oh no no so you said they're four like four like the number it's not the like the number it's four f-o-r-e so yeah you you messed up so no you don't understand so they would try to find little technicalities to try to stop them from voting but here's the problem there were some people that they wanted to vote who couldn't vote because they couldn't read. You know, they just look at the words like, I don't know what this says. Well, try it. What's that W-E? What does that say? Mm -hmm. V? Try again. T? You know, they could not read. So they're like, okay, how can we get around this? And so they somebody had this evil genius plan to say, okay, let's do a grandfather clause where basically if your grandfather voted, then you can vote. But here's the problem with these African-Americans in the 1890s and 1880s, what were their grandfathers doing 40 years before? They were slaves. And could slaves vote? No. Slaves couldn't vote. And they, couldn't even, they weren't even, even allowed to have an education for crying out loud. So because of that, so here's a grandpa, here's the person, you know, the, the, the grandson. Now he can't vote. So what happens is now when he has a son, they're going to look at the next, the next person up, the grandpa, right? This dude's dad. And they're basically going to say, well, the, could he vote? No, he was a slave too. So, hey, you can't vote. And now we get to the original guy because now we're going to look at this guy's son. Was he able to vote? No, because his grandpa way back here could vote, so he couldn't vote. So now the grandson can't vote, and it just continues on and on and on and on every generation. That's the evil genius of that plan, was they made sure that past, because your grandfather, if you go backwards, because he couldn't vote, and things like that, and you keep going back because he couldn't vote and all that stuff, then you can't vote. So, yeah, it was it was really messed up. Now, you would think, okay, now that they got them with that, they're not allowed to vote. That's it. Leave the poor you know, black people alone. No. Now they're saying, we want to separate them. Separate white people and black people. This is where segregation comes in. That's the meaning of it. Separating whites here, blacks here on purpose. So the Jim Crow laws is any law that basically enforced segregation. Any laws that basically make sure that white people are over here, black people are over here, and that they don't mix. Um, in 1883, the Supreme Court said that the 14th Amendment said that no state could deny citizens equal protection 
under the law. Okay. Okay, so the state can't make certain people uh, aim things at certain people because of their race. You know, they have to treat everyone equally. Okay. But they never say anything about private businesses. And that's where hotels, railroads, theaters, restaurants, places like that were allowed to practice segregation. They were allowed to say, okay, white people in front, black people, black people you, you, have, you have the back sections of areas yours. White people can come through the front door. Black people, you have to go through the back door. You know, um, this is where it comes in. Okay. Um, and the thing is, they took this to the Supreme Court, to the biggest court of our land, who's going to look at things and see, is it really justified in the law? And this is where the Plessy versus Ferguson court case comes in. And in 1896, that Supreme Court basically said, yeah, you can separate each side, whites and blacks, but they have to be equal. Each side has to have, you know, equal things, whatever it may be. So there's a loophole they left for those guys. So basically, let's look at schools. Schools are the best examples. So at a white school, they would get a brand new building, brand new, you know, state-of-the-art building. Whereas a black school would basically get a building that's torn down. It's like the roof's about to cave in, right? The white schools will get new books, right? Brand new books. The black schools will get old books, uh, torn up books, you know, pages ripped out, things like that. The white schools will get new desks, new chairs. The black schools will get busted down desks, busted down chairs. Now, why? How is that equal? Because they both have buildings. They both have books and they both have chairs and tables. The thing is, uh, the Constitution or what the the Supreme Court said was they had to have the same. So both has books, buildings and uh, chairs and tables. But they never said anything about the condition of it. They didn't say if a one school has a new books, the other school has to have new books. They didn't say that. So they found that loophole to do that kind of stuff to hinder the education but and hindering the lives of African Americans in the South for years, for like the next like sixty years. Now I know this is not on your notes, but these are just some of the Jim Crow laws uh, that I could find. Uh, there's a ton of them, ton of them from different states. You know, this is just Mississippi, Texas, and Georgia. Uh, and uh, just, uh, again, like I told the class, this is directly from the Jim Crow laws, which is stated, you know, which I could find. Um, so if the language offends you, I do apologize. But um, that's the way they the laws were written back in the 1890s, 1880s, up until the 1950s, you know, 1960s. So, yeah. So, again, if you do feel offended by it, I do apologize. Uh, but this was how the law was written. And uh, you can see for yourself, especially the one that gets me is a burial one. If you look at Georgia, at the very second to the last, you can't bury a white person next to a black person. Um, who cares? They're dead. It's not like your Uncle Bob's going to bu bust out of the ground going, uh, I'm not being buried next to a black person. No, he's dead. What does he care? You know, but that was the law. So. Uh, like I told some um, students in class, if you ever go down to these old southern towns in Georgia, in uh, like South Carolina, Mississippi, um, Louisiana, you'll find that some of these old towns have two cemeteries, at least two. One over here, one on the other side of town. And that's where they buried like the white people and the black people. Now, here is my question to you. Who do you feel did the most damage to America? Those Southern politicians who tried to keep African Americans and uh, poor white people down, make sure they couldn't vote and things like that. Do you think it was the Supreme Court that basically said, you know what? Yeah, it's okay to separate white people and black people. At a time when our country should be coming together, they're making sure, no, y'all separate. Y'all stay over here. You stay on your side, you gotta stay on their side. Or do you think it was the businessmen who made sure that things stayed the same, that the poor stayed poor and the rich got rich. So think about it. 
Use the writing prompt on the bottom. You guys are starting not to use that anymore. Please use it. It help yourself, okay? Um, so go ahead, write your response, okay? But once you finish that, you're done with this lesson. So hopefully you learned something new. Hopefully uh, you took something from this lesson and, you know, it stays in your head that how people were traded and how the people who have power try to maintain that power and um, when people don't do nothing to fight back they get away with it okay so you guys you take care you be safe and i'll see you guys later okay